Numele meu este Radu Plița, sunt profesor consilier școlar aici la Liceu Economic. Um, în urmă cu o săptămână, CJRAE um, a organizat o conferință de psihologie um, internațională, la care a fost invitat un Sam Backlin. Uh, conferința a avut atât de mult succes încât uh, au, au apărut voci care au zis ar fi bine să facem un atelier și cu părinții. Așa că atelierul ăsta cu părinții e un rezultat indirect al acelei conferințe. Da? Uh, atelierul de astăzi uh, este organizat de Inspectoratul Școlar Județean, în parte legat cu CJRAE și cu Liceul Economic. Și îl avem invitat pe domnul Sam uh, care va avea câteva idei legate de parenting. Da? Uh, se va desfășura în felul următor. Uh, domnul Vachin va avea o prezentare. Da? Eu o voi traduce. Da? Așa că să aveți un pic de răbdare, că probabil vor fi întreruperi de genul vorbește o idee, o transmit, o traduc eu după aia. Uh, și puteți să puneți întrebări. We can reverse. You will talk and I will translate. <laughs> Sau așa, da? Yeah, we can try. <laughs> ok. Vă uh, mulțumim că ați venit și o să începem. Uh, atelierul va dura în jur de două ore sau două ore și mai mult dacă aveți mai multe întrebări. Vom vedea. I didn't understand the word he said, but it's true that my name is Sam Vaknin. <laughs> that part I understood. N-am înțeles nimic din cea. I think you understood something. <laughs> let, us, let us keep it between us. Numele <laughs> uh, okay. lui este într-adevăr Sam Vaknin, în restul n-am înțeles din cea. Okay, my name is Sam Vaknin. I'm a professor of psychology in various universities around the world. I'll not make a big introduction out of it. Okay, I'll say that Sam Vaknin is a professor of psychology. He is a professor of university. He is affiliated with the most important universities in the world. Original from Israel. Yes, I'm an Israeli. But it's not my fault. I'm in Vienna, but I'm not a fault. <laughs> if you if you want to drive a car, you need to take driving lessons, and then you need to be tested, and then you drive a car, and then you make an accident, and then you cannot drive a car. So. <laughs> If you want to ride a motorcycle, you need a license. If you want to shoot me with a gun, which most of you would want at the end of the lecture, you would need a license. There is only one thing, actually for which you do not need a license. To have children. It's as if having children is the least important thing. <laughs> no need for, to study anything, no need for a license, nothing. All you have to do in order to have children is to not use contraceptives and get your timing right. <laughs> Tot ce trebuie să faci ca să, să ai copii este să nu folosești mijloace contraceptive și să nimerești... Momentul! Radu, what happened, Radu? <laughs> Radu is learning. Learning on the job. <laughs> I'm explaining too much. <laughs> And there is one group of, in the population who are very happy because of bad parents. Și există un grup de, de oameni din populația generală care sunt foarte fericiți că există părinții răi. Therapists. Terapeuți. Therapists are very happy. Therapists sunt foarte fericiți. Because they are bad parents. Pentru că există părinții răi. In our practice, I'm also, a I'm a professor of psychology, but also a therapist. In our practice, we see the outcomes of bad parenting. În, time and again. În, în practica, na, eu am și practică privată, adică am și cabinet psihologic și vedem multe, multe rezultate ale uh, părinților răi. I'm going to take you on a tour today of 
current thinking about parenting. Să par concem astăzi o să fie un tur legat de uh, curentele locale uh, actuale despre parenting și despre creșterea copilului. But I will start by making two points. Trebuie începe mai întâi să uh, prima uh, uh, transmită două idei. Point number one. The main, the main role of the mother, we are now starting with the mother, the re- main role of the mother is to push the child away. Numărul unu, în primul rând, principalul rol al mamei este să împingă copilul de lângă ea. The main role of the mother is to cause the child frustration and disillusionment. Uh, rolul principal al mamei este să, creez, să genereze la nivelul copilului frustrare și deziluzie. This is what a good mother does. Asta face o mamă bună. We'll come to it a bit later. Vom reveni la asta. The second point I want to make. A doua idee pe care vreau să o transmit este. Families are not needed anymore. Nu mai este nevoie de familie. In the past, the family had many functions. Families provided education in-house. Families provided health care. Health care? <laughs> It's going to explode, I think. Families provided elder care. <laughs> I, hope, I hope she left because of the air conditioning. <laughs> We can't survive here without air conditions. Twenty minutes, it will be in Okay. Wait for it. That's what I meant. Timing. This is the lecture, actually. We so, do you have any questions? We should do it in Romania. <laughs> Just let it be. <laughs> Just let it be. The Romanian way. Yeah. Yeah, okay. <laughs> okay. 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 They took care of old people, like Întrecut, grandmother, grandfather. Today, today the state emptied the family, made it hollow. Education is provided by the state. Well, in some countries. <laughs> Education is provided by the state. Healthcare. Elder care is provided either by the state or by the private sector. Actually, the family is left with one function only. And only one. Mental health. The family is in charge of producing mentally healthy children. Este responsabilă de a produce copii sănătoși mental. No one can do that except mother and father. Nimeni nu poate face asta în afară de mamă și de tată. No state, no municipality, no private enterprise, no one can create a mentally healthy children. Nici alte instituții nu pot crea copii sănătoși mental. All the rest, the family is not needed anymore. Pentru restul serviciilor familia nu mai este nevoie de familie. Now I'm, I'm going to acquaint you with two scholars. Winnicott and Green. Donald Winnicott was a pediatrician. And Andre Green was a psychoanalyst. 
Iar Andrew Green a fost psihanalist. Donald Wilcox came with the concept of good enough mother. Uh, Unicot a, a produs conceptul de mamă suficient de bună. And Andre Green came with the concept of dead mother. Uh, Andrew Green a produs conceptul de mamă moartă. Now, before we proceed, as every woman can tell you, men are not really needed, <laughs> although women pretend that they're needed. Yeah. <laughs> But women are very kind to pretend that we are needed. This is a good thing. It's very nice of you. The fact is that during the formative years, zero to six years, these are called formative years. The mother has the crucial role. The mother determines the mental outcomes, the mental health or mental illness of the child. The father contributes to the raising of the child, but if the father were absent, we actually find out in studies that the outcomes are more or less the same. When the father is absent, there are sometimes problems in social functioning. And depending on the economic circumstances of the family, sometimes there are outcomes in terms of depression and anxiety. But when the single mother is financially independent, the taboo secret is that the children are more mentally healthy than when there is a father present. So, most of this presentation, most of this presentation will deal with mothering, mothers. I am going to mention the roles of the father because I don't want any violence to happen after the lecture. <laughs> But it's the mother that counts. And we are going to, I'm going to start by describing the bad mother. The mother who gets it wrong. The mother who gets it wrong. The mother who sends her children to me as a therapist. And, and you won't believe the number of bad mothers. It's pretty shocking. It's one of the best kept secrets in the industry. Now we distinguish between two types of bad parenting or bad motherhood. The dead mother, which I'm going to start with, and good enough mothers that become dead mothers. They start as good mothers, and then something happens, I will explain what, and they become bad mothers. These kind of mothers are actually worse than dead mothers. Because the child is getting mixed signals and cannot form a presentation of mother in his mind. Okay. Let's start with the classic Cuela. Cuela, it's from a movie. It's from a movie. 
Uh, Andre Green called her, called, the, called her the dead mother. It's not physically dead. The child is not that lucky. She is just dysfunctional. So she is dead. As far as the child is concerned, it's like not having a mother. And I'm going to describe the features, the elements of a dead mother, a mother who is not functioning. The first element is she is overprotective. She protects the child, isolates the child from any risk, real or imaginary. She prevents the child from getting acquainted with reality. Reality hurts. Reality confronts and challenges. The twin engines of growth are loss and pain. We never grow because of good things. That's a myth. We mature and grow up because of bad things, losses. <coughs> the good mother allows her child to be hurt. Allows her child to assume risks. Allows her child to experience pain and rejection. She allows the child to go through this because this is life. When the child grows up, this will be 80-90% of his life or her life. The, I mentioned once to Radu that uh, when I say one word in English, he talks for 20 minutes. And then when I, <laughs> when I talk for half an hour, he says, Pentu. And that's it. <laughs> so. I tried it. It's, it's a fact. It's not, I'm not imagining this. I'm not delusional. <laughs> okay. The, the dead mother regards the child as her property. Her extension. And so she is protective of the child. She doesn't allow the child to, to experience the world. Have you heard of the hygiene hypothesis? Anyone heard of it? It is now the dominant hypothesis in, in child medicine. I'm a medical doctor, so now I'm talking in this capacity. You see what I mean? I said two words. <laughs> I remember I didn't say that you were a physician. I think he's doing this on purpose. It's called passive aggression. Okay. The hygiene hypothesis is very simple. If you isolate the child and you don't allow the child to, to be, get in contact with dirt, with dirty things, contaminated things, this child will be more sick than a child that had been exposed to dirt and contamination. That is established. For example, these kind of children have higher levels of asthma and allergic reactions later in life. A protective mother would not allow the child to touch the earth, to eat the earth, to, to play with dirty toys. She will be overprotective, so she will create a sick child. 
O mamă protectivă, uh, supraprotectoare, nu-i va permite copilului să uh, pună mâna pe mutare, să intre în legătură în contact cu modelia și atunci când va fi adult, acesta va fi un copil, un om bolnav, un adult bolnavicios. The dead mother is absent. She is emotionally neglectful. She goes through the function like a robot. The house is clean, the food is on the table, the husband is away. <laughs> But she is not there. Emotionally. She is like in a dream state. Clinically, clinically we call it dissociation. See, she is dissociative. She cuts herself off reality. She just functions automatically. One of the reasons she is not there is because in her mind the child is not separate from her. So she doesn't have to be there for anyone because there's nobody there. <laughs> she doesn't see the child as separate. <laughs> in other words, she's always alone. The dead mother emotionally blackmails the child. There are four ways to blackmail the child emotionally. Number one, to bribe the child. If you do this, then I will give you this. Exceedingly wrong parenting strategy, but very common. And when the child grows up, he becomes a politician. <laughs> She's a serious mental illness. I mean. That's one form of emotional blackmail. The second form of emotional blackmail is when the mother pretends that she is disabled, that she cannot perform some functions. Disabled. Uh, Disabled. Disabled. I know the Disabled. Disabled. Invalid, invalid. Invalid, <laughs> If you, have, if you have problems with Romanian, just, just tell me. Don't hesitate. Don't hesitate. Radu, please. So, yeah, it's a mother that, that claims all the time, I can't do this, you have to do it for me. Because I'm sick or... I'm weak or I'm tired. It's a form of emotional blackmail. The third is threatening, to threaten. If you don't do this, then I'll punish you. And the fourth way of emotional blackmailing is I sacrificed my life for you. I gave you everything. I could have been, you know, a famous actress or I don't know what. And I gave you all my life, you owe me. I gave you all my life, you owe me. These are all forms of transactions. These are all transactions. It's, it's like the child and the mother are doing business together. I invested my life, you owe me. We are partners, so you will do this, I will do this. If you don't do this, I will go to court <laughs> and sue you. Yeah. The dead mother is aggressive. 
este de obicei agresivă. All dead mothers are aggressive. Dead, remember, not dead physically, yes? Dysfunctional. Ați înțeles că există, zicem, mamă moartă, dar nu din punct de vedere fizic. All dead mothers are aggressive. Toate mamele moarte sunt agresive. So, an aggression has many forms, as many ways. It's like a hydra. You know, it, it... Agresiunea are, are multe forme de a se manifesta. E ca o, e ca o hidră, ca o... So the mother can the mother can give the child the silent treatment. She will not talk to the child for two three days as a form of punishment. The mother could communicate to the child that the child is ugly or stupid. Or a failure, constant failure. In, induce in the child all pervasive shame so that the child becomes socially anxious. We will discuss this a bit later. It has a name. It's called bed, bed object introjection. We'll come to it a bit later. Bed object introjection. Oh, introjection of bed object. Internalization. Yes. As, Can I explain this? Or? Yes, as all of you know, English is corrupted Romanian. <laughs> When I say, for example, simulation, how is it in uh, Romanian? Simula. What did I say? English is corrupted Romanian. <laughs> so. <laughs> so. We'll come to it. When we come to it, we'll translate it properly. Okay. We'll come to it. Spoiling the child. Pampering the child. I don't know um, how to translate this. Uh, putting the child on a pedestal, idolizing the child, worshiping the child. These are forms of abuse. <laughs> Actually, severe abuse. And the reason is that when the mother does this to the child, she completely cuts him off reality. She does not allow him to develop himself inside reality as a separate human being. His actions have no consequences. He can behave badly and still there would be no consequences. I have no idea what. I, yeah, <laughs> his actions, his bad behavior, will have no consequences because he's spoiled. So he will never pay the price ah, for his bad behavior. And he will grow up to be Donald Trump with orange hair. Yeah, not so bad actually. <laughs> come, come in to think of it. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Okay. But seriously, this is a form of abuse. Isolating the child from reality in any way is a form of abuse. Abuse has many forms, of course. There is classical abuse. Physical abuse. Sexual abuse, <coughs> verbal abuse, verbal. psychological abuse. abuse these are all modi, modus, this, these are all moduli of the dead mother. The dead mother abuses in these ways as well. The dead mother instrumentalizes the child, uses the child as an instrument. Most dead mothers have frustrated wishes and dreams. Sounds very bad in Romanian. Dead mothers sounds very bad. I'm sorry, this is the term. <laughs> Most of these mothers, okay, this function. They have frustrated wishes and dreams. And they use the child 
to realize these dreams and unfulfilled expectations. They sacrifice the child, they push the child to become what they think they should and would have become. This is known as instrumentalizing. Next, parentifying. Yes, transforming the child into a parent figure. Actually, I, I coined a new word, adultifying, transforming the child into an adult. Adultifying, making the child an adult. It's when the parent refuses to assume parental roles and chores. Refuses to assume responsibilities. And forces the child to act as the mother, to act as the father. This kind of child never has a childhood. From a very early age, he assumes the role of the adult at home. He always feels that he is not good enough. Because he's a child and usually he fails. He doesn't succeed to be a full-fledged parent. Yeah? In extreme cases, but not uncommon, there is a form of parentifying known as emotional incest. Incest. It's when, it's when the parent uses the child as substitute for an intimate partner. Or when the parent uses the child against the intimate partner. Coalition, makes a coalition. So a mother, a mother would team up with the son against the father. And gradually she will begin to behave inappropriately. Emotionally, and it's very easy to cross into sexual misbehavior. Parentifying, therefore, is extremely dangerous. <coughs> Especially if the child is gifted <coughs> and assumes the role of the intimate partner <coughs> and is very convincing in this role because he is highly intelligent. <coughs> this is definitely a very worrying and dangerous situation. And much more common than you know. If your, if your son sleeps with you and he is 15 years old, shares the bed with you, that's emotional incest, whether you know it or not. If you confide in your daughter the secrets of your relationship with your wife, her mother, that's emotional incest. If you confide in your daughter, if you share, if you share the secrets with your wife, with this creates dynamics which are essentially dynamics of intimate relationships, not dynamics of parent-child. We can therefore summarize and say that dead mothers, or in Romania dysfunctional mothers, uh, are narcissistic. They're narcissists. 
Not all of them, but majority are narcissists. And many of them suffer from depression and, and have anxiety disorders. Dead mothers, dysfunctional mothers, have mental health problems. No exception. So, to be a dead mother is the outcome of mental health issues. Mental health issues. And where do you get these mental health issues? From your mother. <laughs> and where did she get it? From her mother or from listening to one of my lectures? <laughs> so we call this intergenerational trauma. Trauma that is passed <laughs> through the generation. <laughs> if, if you as a mother don't have mental health issues, and when I say mental health, health issues, I mean serious mental health issues. Yeah? You're likely to be a good enough mother. Dead mothers, mentally ill, in effect. Good enough mothers are all the rest. <coughs> Luckily for humanity, majority are actually good enough mothers. <coughs> But the problem is that in good enough mothering, there are three risks. And if the mother falls in these traps, she actually becomes a dead mother. A mother can be mentally healthy. I don't think it's appropriate for a child to be. A mother can be mentally healthy and she could consequently she will be a good enough mother. But then she will fall in these three traps or one of them or all of them and she will become Uh, dysfunctional mother. And I'm going to describe to you these three risks, <coughs> these three traps. By the way, was this what you were expecting from the lecture? Is this what you what you came here for? Yeah? Yes. Okay, okay. No, okay, maybe you came for some other thing. Um, okay. Because I can do another thing, no problem, I can switch. <laughs> We can discuss Bitcoin. <laughs> discuss Bitcoin? <laughs> no? You know about Bitcoin? I know everything, Radu! <laughs> okay. That was a grandiose statement. Grandiosity is the main component of narcissism. Asta was the. Declaration. 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 Yes. Okay. So there are three, three risks or three traps. <laughs> you remember how I started this lecture when we were all when we were all much young. I started by saying that the main role of the mother is to push the child away. A good mother frustrates the child. A good enough mother disappoints the child. 
it's counterintuitive. But if you stop to think about it for a second, you will see how wise it is. Do you want your child to be under your apron for the rest of his life, or do you want him to be an independent person, away from you? Here's the first risk. Some mothers don't allow the child to go away. Don't want to disappoint the child. Don't want to frustrate the child. Don't want to separate from the child. Early in life, between about 18 months to three years, there is a phase called separation individuation. Those of you who would like to read more about it, this is a critical phase in the mental health of a child. You can read the work of Margaret Mahler. Since then, this work had been revised and so on, but, you know, it's good to read her. Like Winnicott, she, she was a pediatrician. By the way, of the ten most important figures in psychology, seven were not psychologists. Freud was not a psychologist, he was a neurologist. Winnicott was a pediatrician. Mahler was a pediatrician. Etc. Et 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 it's an interesting fact. I don't know any other field like this. <laughs> Maybe physics, actually, but it's, it's, um, it's pretty amazing. Anyhow, separation individuation. It means that the child separates from the mother, explores the world, and becomes an individual, divided from mother. Until age 18 months, more or less, mother and child are one unit in the child's mind. This is known as the symbiotic phase. So in the child's mind, mother, mother, me, we're one. At 18 months, something interesting happens. The child becomes a narcissist. He develops enormous grandiosity. He feels that he is godlike. He can dump mommy and explore the world all alone. You know? Can, can you imagine the courage when you are two years old to leave mommy's leg and to explore the next three meters? Can you imagine the courage. It's enormous courage and grandiosity. You feel omnipotent. So the, chi the child separates from mommy, explores the world, and becomes an individual. By separating from mommy, the child creates boundaries. It's a little like the, the Czech, uh, Czechoslovakia. You know? It was symbiotic state, then it broke and created boundaries. 
but also the statistics of the amount of grains and bread. Now all the nice people are in Slovakia and the rest are in Czech Republic. Tak bardzo co mnie tak jest to Slovakia, ale jest to też... So, this is an example of separation, individuation on the collective level. <laughs> Separating for mommy is super, super crucial. The baby develops boundaries. What is boundaries? I stop here, the world starts here. And the world stops here, cannot enter. I start here. The, the child begins to appreciate reality. He, he begins to develop something called reality testing. Not through mommy, independently. The child, the child loses what we call magical thinking. Think about it. The child is this size. I'm exaggerating. This size. And this thing controls one adult, if not two. This gives rise to magical thinking. The child believes in magic. The child believes that whatever is thinking, whatever is thinking, will affect reality immediately. So, when there is separation, the child loses his magical thinking. And because he loses his magical thinking, and because he sees reality, he suddenly realizes there are other people out there. He develops what we call object relations. He, he develops ability to relate to other people. And perhaps most importantly, by separating from the mother, the child is able to form an opinion about himself that is not his mother's opinion. More nuanced. More realistic. Before this phase, the child engages in something called splitting. Splitting. He splits the world. He says, I'm all bad, mommy is all good. When this phase starts, separation and individuation, the child is beginning to integrate, put together. And he says, mother is partly good and partly bad. I am partly good and partly bad. Realism. It's more realistic. So. But many mothers don't allow the child to separate. Because they are insecure. Because they are selfish. Because they are afraid to lose the child, because they have nothing else in life. Because they are children. They are the same level. <laughs> <laughs> they are immature. There are many reasons why mothers refuse to let the child separate. This is a cataclysmic catastrophe in the life of the child. You heard of narcissists? You heard of narcissists? Yes. Narcissists are formed when the mother doesn't allow the child to separate. You heard of psychopaths? 
Same. You heard of borderline personality disorder. Same stage, although in borderline there is there is brain involvement of the brain and genetics. In children, depression, anxiety disorders mostly happen when they are not allowed to separate. If you don't allow your child to separate, if you refuse to frustrate your child, you refuse to disappoint your child, always playing the magical fairy, you are not a good mother. You are actually a very bad mother. And you are damaging your child for life. You are not fairies. You are not wizards. You are not there to protect the child from life. You are there to give life to the child, or to give your child to life. It's terrifying. You take the thing that you love most and you have to expose the child to pain, hurt, danger and risk. It's terrifying. And many mothers don't have the courage. Also, it's terrifying to be left alone. In the pre pre separation individuation phase, you are the child's world. After separation individuation, you are just one more among many. Narcissistic mothers would find it very difficult. They need to be the center of attention. They need to be the focus of their ch child's life and mental world. They feel, they feel rejected and abandoned when the child separates. They are terrified of remaining alone or that they will not be able to recreate this oceanic feeling, this wonderful feeling. We all need unconditional love. I will come to it in a minute. The child is a drug. Drug. It gives you unconditional love. Some mothers become junkies. And they refuse to let go of the drug. And they destroy the child for life. This is the first risk. I said there were three. Oh, no! Okay, yeah, three. The, the second risk is, is this. Raising children seriously sucks. I prefer to work in a coal mine. Raising children is tiring, breaks your body and mind. It's the most horrible job imaginable. After the chief of the WHO. <laughs> so, WHO. WHO. The first worst job in the world is head of WHO. Second is mother. Yeah. It sucks. So, so mothers have to lie to themselves. All mothers lie to themselves. All. No exception. 
You all lie to yourself. And this process of lying, deceiving yourself, is called idealization. You idealize the child. You create a representation of the child in your mind that is ideal. You all know that your child is the most beautiful, intelligent, amazing child ever born. This is idealization, of course, because, because he is not. <laughs> and yet, even if the child is not as beautiful and not as intelligent, and you know, you still have to change his diapers. And you still have to wake up in, at night or sleep two hours at night because this not so beautiful, not so intelligent child is crying all the time. Idealization is very useful. If you were unable to idealize, I would not be here today. In my case, the idealization was justified, of course. Yeah. Of course. But, in the majority of cases, this is not the case. Now, what is idealization? Is you make, you make a photograph of the child, a snapshot, You put it inside your head and you Photoshop it. You use Photoshop. Okay, and then you have an imaginary child in your head. This process, for those of you who are here to study psychology for some reason, this process is known as internalization interjection. I think I insulted him. <laughs> It's too much. He was not idealized. <laughs> so, what's the risk? The risk is if the mother remains stuck in the idealization phase. She cannot exit the idealization. She remains stuck. The risk is that the mom is blocked in the phase of idealization. She doesn't see the child as he really is, but she sees the idealized image of the child. And she interacts with the idealized image, the introject, not with the child. So what's wrong with it? The child grows, develops, And gradually, if this is the idealized image, at the beginning, at the beginning, the child is almost like the image. But then the child grows, develops, separates, has 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 friends, has new interests. When when there is a gap opening when there is a divergence between the real child and the idealized image, the introject. The mother becomes aggressive. She's trying to force the child back into the idealized image. This creates enormous conflict. And the mother begins to regard the child as an enemy. This is called persecutory object dynamic. Right. <laughs> She regards the child as a persecutor, as someone who is destroying her life. Such mothers, such mothers will say he is a very difficult child. He's disobedient. I can't control him. I gave up on him. I wish I will give him up for adoption. I don't know. She just wants to get rid of the child. 
This is the second risk. So you remember, the first risk, you don't allow the child to separate from you. You corset the child, you prevent the child from pain, hurt, disappointment, etc. That's the first risk. The second risk is you idealize the child and then you get stuck on the idealization and refuse to see the real child. These are the risks for good enough mothers. Not for dysfunctional mothers. Dysfunctional mothers are dysfunctional <laughs> to start with. This is risk for good enough mothers. There's a third risk. Luckily, there are only three. There's a third risk, and it happens in adolescence. Not the mother's adolescence, the child. <laughs> the child adolescence. When the child becomes an adolescent, an adolescent, he develops. All all children develop something called reactance. Uh, Reactance has three components. Let's see you translating this. <laughs> right. I got you. <laughs> Radu and I, you know, are doing this. Okay, in adolescence, the adolescent develops reactance. All adolescents develop reactance. Reactance has three components. The adolescent becomes defiant. Whatever you say is against, whatever you suggest is always against. And he's against openly, openly, in your face. He's confrontational. If this survives to adulthood, it becomes a main feature of psychopathy. The second is negative identity formation. A doua componentă este formarea negativă a identității. The adolescent defines her identity in opposition to you. Adolescentul își definește identitatea lui în opoziție față de tine. I am not going to be like my mother. Eu nu voi fi ca mama mea. I am never going to repeat my father's mistakes. Niciodată nu voi repeta so, șerile tatălui. So, there is negative identity formation. Her identity depends on who you are not. <laughs> Not on who you are. The third is contumaciousness. Don't get alarmed. Radu, <laughs> take your pill. <laughs> Beta blocker. <laughs> contumaciousness means rejection of authority. It's also called control aversion. Rejection of authority, and because you are an authority, he rejects you. the adolescent rejects you. This is very painful. Adolescence is very painful period for the parents, because the parents are good friends, could be good friends with the child until adolescence. Now you can say vaccine. This is not true. My son is an adolescent, he's, and he's my best friend. And he sees me as a role model, he imitates me. And he never defies me. And when I suggest something, he usually says yes. I recommend the nearest therapist. <laughs> This is, these are not good signs. These are signs of disturbance in separation individuation. 
parents, good enough mothers, and now also fathers. These are known as good enough parents. If they, if they regard this as a personal attack or personal insult, narcissistically, they will take it as, as a narcissistic injury. They react with a power play. They create a power play. Power play between them and And everything becomes about control. Who controls? Who makes the decisions? Who is on top? Who is? Of course, if you stop to think about it for a minute, the, f the parent beca becomes an adolescent. Parents is doing exactly what the adolescent is doing. So, this is the third trap, and it happens in adolescence. If a power play develops, there is a serious risk of psychopathy. Or, at the very least, self-destructiveness. Self-destructiveness. Yeah. auto Yeah. auto <laughs> So, and this is because the adolescent is caught, caught in a conflict, in a dilemma. On the one hand, the adolescent is dependent on his parents. Secretly still admires them. But on the other hand, needs to separate. It's a second phase of separation. Needs to separate. The good enough parent allows the adolescent all these, allows him to behave in these ways. The good enough parent creates something called sublimatory channel. Sublimatory channel. Sublimatory channel means the good enough parent creates for the adolescent ways to express defiance, uh, rejection of authority, and so on, in a way that is acceptable to society, socially acceptable. In the first phase of separation and individuation, the parent, the good enough parent, frustrates the child, rejects the child, pushes the child, disillusions the child. In the second phase of separation, in adolescence, the parent encourages the child to behave in these ways. But, but in socially acceptable ways. I'll give you an example. Uh, defiance and contumaciousness, uh, rejection of authority. These two. If there is a power play with the parent, the child can become delinquent, can become a criminal. So, so a bad parent, a parent who is, you know, playing macho with the child, well, I'm in charge, no, I'm in charge. This kind of parent is pushing the child away, and the child can become uh, antisocial. But there is a sublimatory alternative. 
de sublimare a acestui comportament. Social activism. Activismul social. Protesting. Protestare. Protesting against corruption. Să protestezi împotriva corupției. Protesting against racism. Împotriva rasismului. Protesting against climate change. Împotriva schimbărilor climatice. Protesting against professors of psychology who speak only English. <laughs> you know? Protesting. Protesting and social activism are sublimatory channel for defiance and rejection of authority. Protest. Protestele sunt modalități de sublimare a schimbării și a These are the three risks, the three traps that can convert you from good enough mother to bad mother. What is the job description of good enough mother? How does she look like? What, what does she do? What's her behavior? First of all, and most importantly, She sees the child. We all need to be noticed and seen. You don't believe me? Go on Facebook. We all need to be noticed and seen. And there is. I feel abused, molested. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Um, I hope you don't take my jokes uh, too badly, because they're not jokes; they're real. <laughs> We all need to be seen and to be noticed. And I think that the rise in narcissism globally, is because there are too many people. Now we need to work hard to be noticed and to be seen because there are too many of us. So we need we need to radicalize, we need to escalate to be noticed. Go on TikTok, if you don't believe me. See what's going on? Does I mean millions of, of teenage girls undressing simply? They need to be seen. They need to be noticed. Why? Why this need? Even in adults. Why do we have this? Because as a baby, if you're not seen, you're dead. Excuse me, copil is child or baby? Child. Child? But baby, how would we say? Bebeluș. Ah? Bebeluș. Bebeluș. Es bebeluș. 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 Ah, with a nail. Es bebeluș. If you are not seen, if, if you are not noticed, you are dead, bebeluș. Because mother needs to notice you to give you food. The need to be seen is primordial, atavistic, is foundational, is uh, a survival strategy. When we are not noticed and not seen, we feel dead. And we develop anxiety. And then we divorce. There's a lot of problem in being seen in relationships, yeah? Okay. The good enough mother sees her child. She, she, allows, she allows the child to see, to see himself through her eyes, through her gaze. When the child sees himself through the mother's eyes, the child realizes there is someone there who is not mommy. If mommy sees me, then I am not mommy, because mommy sees me. Uh, 
E cineva acolo, înseamnă că eu nu sunt mama. And this is the beginning of the self. Și asta este începutul formării ego-ului. Indivi part of individuation. Beginning of the self. Și uh, parte din individu individualizare, din separarea de mamă. Also, this helps to develop empathy. De asemenea, uh, acest lucru uh, ajută copilul să dezvolte empatie. If, if mother sees the child and because she loves the child, it's a great definition of empathy, is to see someone lovingly, compassionately. Radu has severe difficulties with empathy. <laughs> He has, he has blockage, he cannot translate these words. No, no. <laughs> okay, I will say it again. <laughs> so the good enough mother sees the child, okay? Actively, proactively, not just sees, but proactively. She tells the child, I'm seeing you, I'm noticing you, I'm, you're here, oh, you're here, I love you. These are all indications that you are seen. Your sin is separate from me. So you can begin to have a self safely and you can begin to empathize the way I am empathizing with you as your mother. These are crucial, crucial uh, steps. Indeed, oh, it's been, uh, sorry. Faptul că mama, copilul vede mama și mama îl iubește, îi transmite emoții pozitive, îl face pe copil să vrea să facă același lucru la rândul lui. Și în felul ăsta se dezvoltă empatia. By the way, uh, I'm serious now. I'm almost never serious, but now I'm serious. I'm serious. Uh, if any of you feels the need to, to leave because you're bored or I don't know what, I'm not, uh, you know, Ceaușescu. You can, <laughs> you can leave. I also think I look better than Ceaușescu, but you know, this is my curiosity. <laughs> but feel free to leave. I mean, Don't, don't, uh, I will cry after that, but it's okay. <laughs> okay. When the child is seen, beho behold, when the child is beheld, when the child is seen. By the way, it's interesting in English, to see is to behold. To hold. Și hold este și a îmbrățișa, nu? Hold. A ține în braț. To see is not just to see, it's to hold, to contain. Deci a vedea, când zicem a vedea copilul, nu înseamnă numai a îl vedea vizual, dar este a îmbrățișa. Da, simți emoțional, da, simți din punct de vedere emoțional, da? So, when the child is seen, he feels safe. Și atunci când copilul este văzut, se simte... There's a sense of safety. Because you remember with the bebeluche, the, to be seen is to be fed. To be seen is to be safe. When the mother sees the child, he feels safe and the mother becomes something called safe or secure base. Când se simte sigur, atunci mama devine o bază sigură. Da? Asta e uh, teoria atașamentului emoțional, că copilul se atașează emoțional de mamă și vede tot timpul mama ca pe o bază la care se poate întoarce tot timpul. Why does a child need a safe base? De ce are nevoie copilul de o bază sigură? Because he needs to say goodbye to mommy Pentru and separate. Are nevoie să se separe de mama, să-i spună papa. If mother is not safe, the child will be afraid to separate. Dacă mama nu este în siguranță, copilul îi va fi, îi va fi frică să se separe. Those of you who have children, I assume, majority, you know that a child, when they begin to separate, they walk a few steps and they look back. They look back and see if you're still there. This is safe-based dynamic. Știți că atunci când copilul începe să se îndepărteze de tine, face câțiva pași, se uită înapoi, da? Asta se numește dinamica bazei sigure, da? And they run back to you. Și apoi fug înapoi la tine. I'll have you, and then try again. 
So, no. this is safe base. This, the safe base mother, by the way, never the father. Normally. So, the safe base mother is empathic, attuned, resonant with the child, uh, can read the child almost without words, or usually without words, can read the child. She's caring, she's caring, and she's accepting, caring. Sharing, sharing is caring. caring. Did you say scary? No, caring. caring. All mothers are scary, but this <laughs> this mother is scary. Caring. Okay. You destroyed my little one. Visually, visually, okay, visually. Okay. Poor Radu had to translate three of my lectures, and much more complex than this. And he did a great job. He did a great job. That's why I did not fire him. <laughs> You're not paying me, so. <laughs> it's a question of time. Question of time, Radu. Question of time. Okay, these are all jokes. Don't take any of it seriously. Okay. Radu will beat me up. Beat me up after that. So, caring. Caring. But above all, accepting. She doesn't reject the child or any aspect of the child. She provides safety, structure, order, predictability. This is the second element of a good enough mother. The next element involves the father. Surprisingly. <laughs> the next element is preparing the child for reality. There are three types of preparation for reality. Physical reality. Don't cross the road because a car will run over you and nothing will happen to the car. Don't put your hand on a, on a hot oven unless you want barbecue. So, this kind of, this is physical. Social. Social. Don't spit on grandmother. <laughs> For example, unless she deserves it. So, <laughs> So this is social preparation for reality? And preparation for hegemonic culture, for the dominant culture. So there are names for this. Preparation for social reality is called socialization. And preparation for hege hegemonic culture, for dominant culture, is called acculturation. Uh, so here, the father is involved. Actually, actually the, the father is a socialization agent, like the mother. Uh, when the father is absent, there might be problems in preparation for reality. It's another important function of a good enough mother and a good enough father. If they don't prepare the child for reality, they are delinquent. They are not good. Now the father has three roles which are unique to the father. And Mother has little to do with it. The first role is skills acquisition, acquiring skills. Primul rol este acela de a dobândi abilități. 
So anything from banging with a hammer to you know studying in, in the university. It's the father usually who provides this skill, skill acquisition. In today's modern world, about 43% of children are raised by single mothers. În ziua de azi, aproximativ 43% dintre copii sunt crescuți de mame singure. Um, these mothers have to provide skills acquisition. Și din această cauză, aceste mame sunt nevoite să asigure ele uh, modelul ăsta de cum să-ți formeze abilități. Because there's no men present. present în viața copilului. It's a huge experiment and we're still not sure of the outcomes. E un experiment enorm și încă nu suntem siguri de rezultatul pe care îl va avea. The second role of the father is to provide gender role differentiation. Al doilea teach... al tatălui este să ofere uh, diferențiere între roluri de gen. To cut a long story short, the father teaches the boy how to be a man and teaches the girl how to be a woman. Pe scurt, tatăl îl învață pe copil uh, cum să devină bărbat sau cum să fie bărbat, iar pe fetiță cum să fie femeie. Not the mother. Nu mama face. It's a common mistake to think that the mother teaches the daughter how to be a, a woman. E o, e o greșeală destul de comună. Uh, se crede că mama învață uh, fata cum să devină femeie. Girls acquire gender role in interaction with the first male they see, which is the father. Fetele, fetele își dezvoltă identitatea de, de gen, da, și uh, modelul uh, de femeie, din interacțiune cu primul bărbat din viața lor, care este tatăl. Gender roles are socially, culturally determined. They have very, very little to do with biology. Uh, rolurile de gen uh, sunt foarte mult determinate de cultură, de societatea în care, în care crește. We have, for example, societies, even primitive societies, like Northern Albania, where women can decide that they are men. Avem diferite societăți în care chiar și societăți din Nord Albania, în care femeile pot să decidă că sunt bărbați și nu sunt femeile. From the moment they decide they are men, I'm sorry. From the moment they decide they are men, they have all the rights of men, for example, to sit in a cafe and smoke. In Africa, in Africa where I, I worked for four years, genders are totally fluid. Genurile sunt foarte fluide. You can transition between male roles, female roles, I mean, poți, poți, in almost all the cultures that I've seen. Poți să schimbi între, între rolurile de femeie, rolurile de bărbat, da? But don't confuse gender with sex. Dar nu confundați genul, asta e identitatea de gen, cu uh, cea sexuală. Don't confuse anything with sex, that's a good idea. <laughs> Ideea But... e bună să nu confundați nimic cu sexul, nu? Sex is biological. Sexul e un lucru biologic. We have more than two sexes, but... All of them are biological. Gender is social cultural. That's why the father determines gender. Because he... Last role of the father is sexual scripts. Sexual? Scripts. Scripts. Now, sexual script is... is to... Yeah, is to tell the, the boy how to behave with girls and to tell the girl how to behave with boys. In my generation, for example, which was the last few years of the dinosaurs, so we... <laughs> I, I didn't go out with dinosaurs. <laughs> with <laughs> mixed <laughs> species. But in my generation, for example, the sexual script was that I pay, if I go out with a girl, I pay, you know, I initiate. Uh, I initiate, 
Um, I open doors. I take off coats. And if the coat is expensive, I live in the back door of the restaurant. <laughs> That's called sexual script. So fathers convey Asta sexual script. We are in a period of enormous transition for two reasons. Fathers are missing. And there are no longer agreed upon, socially agreed upon, gender roles and sexual. Repeat that. We are. Oh. We are in a period of enormous transition. Fathers are missing. Again, about 43% of children in industrialized countries are raised by single mothers. So there are no fathers. And the second problem is that gender roles and sexual scripts are no longer agreed society-wide. As a debate. This creates a state, a condition called anomi. 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 Anomi is. Anomi means that there are no norms. No normative. What is the profile of the good enough mother? And with this I will finish and if you have questions, you can ask them and then all the other people will be very angry. Okay, let's return to the mother of the good enough mother. What is the profile of the mother of the good enough mother? We'll discuss about this. And then if you want to ask questions, you can ask questions and probably all the other people will be very angry. Because they want to go home. They are hostages. <laughs> they are hostages for you. Okay, how does the good enough mother look like? What's her pers what is it that she provides? I think in one phrase, unconditional love. But, be very careful, because people confuse. They think unconditional love is forgiving everything, da, accepting everything. Forgiving everything, accepting everything, um, believing in everything. That's not unconditional love. That's stupidity. It's gullibility. I don't know gullibility in Romanian. Don't ask me, don't look at me. Radu, I don't know how to say it in Romanian. Gullibility. Gullibility is when you believe everything people tell you. Credulity, yes. Credulity. So, unconditional love is not about being credulous. Not even in Romanian. Unconditional love is something completely different. It's about being aware of the child, having intimate knowledge of the child, as I said, accepting the child, trusting the child, trusting. Many, many parents don't trust the child. To separate effectively, you need to trust the child, to walk these three steps. Not to run after the child. Allow the child to become to become what we call self-efficacious. In other words, allow the child to experiment. Get burned, get wounded, have pain, hurt. It's called learning. 
Asta poate să numesc învățare. Or in some countries elections. So, Sau alegeri în unele cazuri. So I would say that being a good good mother or good enough mother is allowing the child to become through the mother's gaze, through the way the mother sees the child. Allow the child to grow up, to mature, to become an adult without fear. And without anxiety, without blackmail, without control, without power play, just look at the child, let the child see your love in your gaze, and be as passive as you can. Active parenting is, in most cases, bad parenting. Nature knows. Don't teach nature. The child will grow separate from you, even if you don't do anything all the time. <laughs> Just let it be. Let, let the child be. You are too involved. It's not about the child, it's about you, it's about your anxiety. You are trying to reduce your anxiety by, by deceiving yourself that you have control. You hardly have control over yourselves. How can you have control over another? Be humble. Be humble. You don't. You're not gods. And you should not assume godlike roles. You are custodians. You're guardians. And, and you are collaborators with nature. But don't make a mistake. Nature is the majority partner. You are a little more than employees. And most of you are not always doing a good job. The child cannot fire you. Although in some countries he can, actually. In California, the child can fire his parents. But in California, everything is possible. So. <laughs> But the child cannot fire you. He's stuck with you. Make it a pleasant experience. Make it a growing experience. Don't establish a prison. A camp. A boot camp, you know, in the army, the, <laughs> the first phase. Don't always be there. Don't always be there. <laughs> Don't think that your presence is, is always a good thing. Learn the art of absence, the art of letting go. Let the child discover things in sometimes a painful way. It's the only way the child will remember and learn. So, this is the lesson of a good enough mother. She is there, she is safe, she is stable, she... Safe. She always sees the child, but she does not interfere. There's a difference, um, there's a difference between having um, an alliance with someone and having that someone invade you, as you pray in this Don't invade your child, be the child's ally.
Okay, those of you who survived this lecture. Okay, cei care supraviețuit aceste prezentări. Totally unexpectedly. Total neașteptat, așa de mulți. I'm uh, open to questions. Uh, of course, there will be no answers. Just ask the questions. Trebuie să puneți întrebări. So I'm open to questions. I would like to thank Radu for his work. I think he deserves uh, recognition. It's. Uh... We thank you. Huh? We should thank you. We thank you for the lectures. Oh, why? I enjoy it. <laughs> why should you thank me? Okay, guys and girls. By the way, in 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 the West, guys means also women. In the modern world, the, the difference is severe. <laughs> so, if you have any any questions, I may have. Majority of the parents here are uh, adolescent. Majority of pa parents, of, parents of, of adolescents. Okay. Okay. I was worried for me. <laughs> <laughs> How could they correct some, some of the mistakes that they did until now as dysfunctional mothers? If the, if the mistakes happened in a very early stage of life, like second year, first year of life, the damage is very serious and requires professional help. Damage, damage in adolescence is more limited, much more limited, and usually transient. It's not. The critical years are between zero and six, and in these years, for example, if you refuse to let the child separate, the damage is serious and lifelong. Cei mai importanti sunt primii ani de viață, 0-6 ani și de obicei dacă ai făcut greșel de n-ai permis separarea copilului și independența lui, atunci are o făcut e destul de serios și s-ar putea să aibă nevoie de terapie. And then it's only therapy, we don't have any other, any other technique and... Nu avem altă, altă modalitate decât psicoterapie. It's about years or it's about the period, short period of time? I'm sorry? It's about years? For a short period of time, when you need to save a child that has passed through that situation of that mother. Separation takes about a year and a half. If uh, in the okay, but when to pass through this situation as a child, how many years of therapy do you need? <laughs> oh, as many as possible. <laughs> <laughs> So we can buy a new car. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the car is open. Five years is amazing for a car. It depends, it depends, uh, depends on the way. Depends on the way the child had reacted. Now, uh, luckily, uh, luckily. Oh, sorry. Majority of the uh, children react to problems in separation individuation with mild, very mild uh, attachment, attachment style disorders. So this is known as, ins they have insecure attachment style. About 15% of children exposed to dysfunctional mother develop uh, uh, personality disorders 
most notably narcissistic personality disorder cel mai mult tulburări de personalitate narcisistă and borderline personality disorder if there is a already genetic problem with the brain and so on. tulburare borderline dacă există și o predispoziție genetică this requires a lot of work in in adulthood with in the case of narcissistic personality disorder it's a waste of time uh, asta necesită multă <laughs> muncă în viața ta catalog so short în cazul tuburilor din narcisiste, e chiar, e chiar inutilă, pentru că nu se poate. Very we can do. Nu putem face. We can modify behavior. We can help the narcissist modify some behaviors. But putem să ajutăm narcisistul să-și modifice unele comportamente the, care fac rău celorlalți. The da. picture is much better with borderline. Uh, situația este mult mai, mult mai bine la tuburarea borderline. The prognosis is much better with borderline. The prognosis e mai bun la tuburarea borderline. About 80%, 81% of people with borderline personality disorder lose the diagnosis spontaneously by age 45. The dialectical behavior therapy, which is the therapy we use for borderline, is 50% effective within one year. Specifică pentru tulburarea borderline se numește terapia cognitiv-dialectică și în cazul urmării unui astfel de tip de terapie, 50% din, din borderline se remit, da, le dispar simptomele în, în primul an de terapie. About 50%. 50%. Uh, anxiety disorders, mood disorders, mainly. They tend to be lifelong. In such children, they tend to be lifelong. They are managed with medication and so. There is damage. There's no no sense to pretend that there is no damage, or that the damage can be undone. There is damage. Există vrele care sunt, da? Nu trebuie să ne prefacem că nu sunt, da? Se pot face lucruri din prința lor. And separation individuation is only one. I mentioned, I think, a total of seven or eight. Mă rog, și problemele legate de separare și individualizare e doar una dintre motivele care conduc la tulburări mentale. Țineți minte că am zis la început că sunt șapte, opt, da? Being a mother is an impossible job. Să fii mamă e o slujbă imposibilă. She needs to be loving and push the child away. She needs to protect the child because the child can kill, kill itself. You know? She needs to protect the child. But also let the child experiment. It's a totally self-contradictory job. And the main problem is this. If you have a mental health issue, problema principală este că dacă tu ca mama ai o problemă, ai o problemă de uh, sănătate mentală, you, as a mother, if you have a mental health issue, the child will trigger it. Uh, atunci copilul o va declanșa. The child is like a trigger. He will make it worse. Copilul o va face mai mai rea. He will make it manifest. O va face să se manifeste. There are reasons for that. The child regresses you. The child pushes you back to childhood. In some ways you become infantile when you have a child. So if the mother is not mature, depressed, anxious, narcissistic, um, absent, emotionally, has, has problem with attachment, then the child will make it worse, never better. Never better. And one of the big mistakes people make, they think the child will cure them, the child will make it better. Cred că copilul îi va vindeca. Din contră, copilul îi va face să simtă să fie mai rău. Even couples think if they bring a child, it will bring the couple back together. Chiar există credința asta la nivelul cuplurilor, că dacă nu se înțeleg, dacă vor face un copil, îi va face să fie mai uniți și vor fi mai bine. Children make things worse. Din contră. Not better. Nu răutățesc lucrurile, nu le îmbunătățesc. If there is already a bad dynamic in the couple, dacă deja există o dinamică 
in the couple. The child will make it worse. Emphasize it. For example, if the husband is narcissistic and he wants attention from his wife. The minute the child is born, the husband begins to compete with the child. And he becomes, he becomes aggressive with the wife because she's giving attention to the child, not to him. It's an example of a dynamic that the child makes worse, not better. If you're anxious, the child will increase your anxiety, not reduce it. And if you're depressed, if you have a background of depression, your chance to have postnatal depression is eight times higher. If you have a history of major depression. So, children are hard work. Hard work. They put enormous stress on them. They make demands that require self-denial and self-sacrifice. You need to be very strong and centered and grounded to survive a child. Here I will tell you secretly, just you and me, none of these listening. Just you and me. Not much difference between a newborn child and an abusive relationship. Not much difference. And there's a reason for that. If you have an abusive partner, he is likely a child. An abusive partner is someone who did not, did not have a good enough mother. An abusive partner is someone, abusive partner is someone who is stuck in childhood, is infantile. So, if you have an abusive partner, you are a mother, by definition. A newborn child is a replica of a relationship with an abuser. No one will say this, of course. <laughs> they will lose their jobs. But it's the truth. And if you talk to mothers, they have their reactions are very much like reactions of abused abused women. Some mothers perceive the child as a, an abuser, a persecutor. Especially immature women and so. So you need to be, that's, you remember how we started this lecture when there was a previous regime in the government? So we started the lecture, I started the lecture by, by saying that you need a license to drive, and you need, but you don't need a license to be a mother or a father. In an ideal world, everyone will undergo psychological evaluation, and if you are, if you have narcissistic personality disorder, you will not be allowed to have children. It will be a criminal offense. If you have schizophrenia, psychotic disorder, bipolar disorder, several personality disorders, I could make a list. And these, and these people should not have children. It's not a God-given right to, to have children. Not enshrined anywhere. That's not written anywhere. Not even in the Constitution of Romania. I'm sure. <laughs> so, we, we take it for granted. It is? 
Oh, in your constitution? Okay. <laughs> because in Romania they are not they are not dysfunctional. You have the liberty to pro procreate. <laughs> Because in Romania there are no dysfunctional mothers. It's what. <laughs> but that's why I started with licensing. Because I'm a firm, I'm a firm believer that if you need a license to ride a motorcycle, you need a license to have a child. <laughs> Să crești un copil. 